in John chapter 2. We're taking the life of Jesus, putting it all in chronological order, kind of following him all the way from the, all the, way from the prophecies in the, in, the, in the book of Genesis. We'll follow him all the way through to the book of Revelation in the second coming. And so now we have landed here, still very early in the Life of Christ series. We've landed in John chapter 2. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. You will need a Bible today. Praise the Lord. The wedding feast of Canaan is Jesus has um, just a handful of his disciples in tow. Here he has Nathaniel and, 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 and Peter and Andrew and Philip. These four now are, are with him as now they go to the wedding feast. One of the very first things that Jesus does in his public ministry is he tends a party. This is very cool because Jesus, whenever he's with us, it should be a party. It should be a joyous time. Guys, listen, if your religion is making you, is making you narrow and sour and judgmental, if your religion is making you point fingers at one another, if that's your religion, you didn't get that from Jesus. You got that from someplace else. Because the relationship, the religion that we have with Jesus Christ following him is joy. In fact, we could spend now 20 minutes reading all the scriptures that concern joy there is in following God. In Nehemiah 8, it says, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. In Psalm 5, it says, but let all those who rejoice, who put their trust in you, let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. Do you love the name of the Lord? Be joyful in the things of God. Romans 14 says, For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness and peace. Listen to this. Romans 14, and joy in the Holy Spirit. There's great joy in knowing Christ. There's great joy in walking with Him. You guys have heard me say this before. It's absolutely true that when I first came to Christ, it was this. This will be real, and this will be a day-to-day walk with you, or I won't do it. I'm not going to do something religious just to be doing it. I'm not going to do something because I... I know, that I'm, I know that I am undone. I know that, that without Christ, I'm a horrible person. With him, I'm working on it, all right? Okay? But the thing is this, is that, that there is joy in walking with him. There's joy in following Christ. In fact, when you look at what we're going to do, when you take your last breath, we're standing in presence, one of the first things we're going to do, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to a party. It ought to be a party right now, though. It ought to be joy in this journey. And I tell you what, if following Jesus, when we really follow him, we really understand who he is and walk with him, there truly is joy. Even in the midst of a storm, even in the midst of difficulties, life sucks sometimes, all right? That's the reality of it, right? Life is difficult sometimes. However, God is always good. And God is always there. And he'll always walk with us. Man, we never want to forget that. So he takes, and I think this is strategic. I believe that none of the Bible is just, just happenstance. I believe this is strategic, is that he begins his public ministry at a wedding. When we stand in his presence, we begin our eternity uh, in heaven with a wedding, the wedding marriage of the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So a beautiful thing. Let's go through the text. I got some things we want to talk about, about this wedding. It says, now on the third day, there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. So now it's the third day after, um, after Nathaniel has begun to follow him. Third day after, now he's beginning to get some of the disciples together. And now he's got these, just a handful of disciples in tow. He goes to Canaan of Galilee. Today, it's the modern city of Canaan. It's probably not the site of this event. There's a... There's a uh, there's a ruined city just up the road. That is most likely the actual site of the ancient city of Canaan. Um, that's beside the point. There is a cool church that sometimes we'll visit uh, that has a big courtyard. If you want to get married, it's a nice place to get married. Uh, we've had weddings there. I've married somebody on the boat on the, on the Sea of Galilee. I've married somebody uh, there in, uh, not me, I, I was doing, I was officiating the wedding. I was like, we're in Utah, I forget. You know, it's like, you know, I married somebody here. So I married somebody in, um, in the garden tomb. Uh, we did a wedding renewal of their vows in the, in the, in the garden tomb, which was very, 
very cold there in Jerusalem. And so this is one of the places in Canaan. A lot of people want to get married there. And there's a lot of a huge schedule of people getting married there. There's also a basement that's there. They show you these big jars that they believe is one of the jars that Jesus turned water into wine. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, you can buy some wine there. I wouldn't recommend it. It's nasty, but you can buy some if you want to. Have it on your shelf there. Uh, wine from Canaan. And so here they are at, the, at Canaan. There's a wedding. Now, Jesus and the disciples were invited to the wedding. Look at verse 3 now. And again, you're familiar with this story if you've been saved for very long. It says, then, the, then uh, they ran out of wine. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So he says here, uh, his mother says, hey, Jesus, they ran out of wine. And you can do that miracle thing you do. You know, you know who you are. Uh, make wine. And um, Jesus said, woman, now don't think that's a derogatory term. It's not. It's the same word he'll use from the cross. All right. It's a word of endearment, not of, you know, woman, what your backhand to you. He doesn't, that's not what he's doing. All right. He's not saying that. He's saying woman, it's more of a, a term of endearment. Okay. Again, it's the exact same word he'll say from the cross when he's addressing his mother. And so woman, uh, what does your concern have to do with me? What does it have to do with me? It's not time yet. My hour is not yet come. We've talked a lot about that, that Jesus is on a time schedule, literally heading towards a moment in time where he'll be nailed to the cross. This whole thing about time. You can't, get, you can't go through the life of Christ without seeing that he's on a time schedule. He says, it's not yet. The time has not yet come for me to just come out in the open. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk more about that as we get into the story in the days to come. It says, the mother uh, said to the servant, whatever he says to you, do it. Well, it, it's just, I love Mary here because it's like, he just said to her, uh, you know, what does that do with me? My hour's not come. And she goes, well, do whatever he says. He's going to do it anyways, you know. <laughs> and him being a good son, he's going to go ahead and does this, this thing. And so um, very interesting little subtle thing there. Uh, now uh, there were set six water, water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews uh, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Okay. Jesus said, fill uh, the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. And so he gets out there, he goes, okay, so what do you have here? You got these water pots that were used for water purification. This is something that's going to come into huge play as we, as we dialogue about the disciples and the, and the Pharisees, and they're, they're, they're saying, how come you're... How come your master eats with unwashed hands? What does that have to do uh, with anything? Well, it has a lot to do with the culture of the time and the Pharisees. They had all this, and the religious people had all this really um, intricate washings that they did. So before you came into a house, you'd wash uh, your hands, you'd do a foot washing, all this. So this water was set out for that. So this, so some of the water's out of these, these jugs. Now, I want you to notice here, there's six of them. They, they contain 20 to 30 gallons apiece. I want you to get this in your mind. You know what's going to happen. Jesus is going to turn this all into wine. All of this. So you got, so say, let's just say it's 25 gallons. We'll, we'll average between 20 to 30, so 25. You got six of them. That's how much again now? 150. Very good. Amen. You win the prize today. So 150 gallons. Now out of a gallon of wine, you get about five bottles. How do I know this? I just know this. Trust me. All right. And so out of a gallon. And so, so you're talking about, you're talking about 750 bottles of wine. Now, if you buy this wine in Utah, you're going to pay at least $30 a bottle. Okay. Hello. All right. Because they got tax and stuff. And that's if it's going to be cheap wine. So, so this is going to be more expensive. But we're going to say $30 a bottle. This is $22,000 worth of wine. 750 bottles of wine. We're talking a lot of wine right here. All right? And this is not that cheap stuff either. This is, this is, this is this Boone's Farm stuff. This is good stuff. All right? <laughs> so here you have... Here you have him making the wine. Now, there's no way out of this. We're going to talk about wine today. We're talking about should Christians drink wine. We're going to talk about these things. But here's the thing is this, is that, uh, and don't you leave in the middle of this because you'll misunderstand what I'm going to say to you, all right? <laughs> but uh, the, the wine here was fermented. There's no way out of this. This was fermented wine. For those who say, well, it's just grape juice, it doesn't work in the context of this passage. It doesn't work in the history of this thing. Now, to be out of wine at a wedding feast, now this is a tragedy to the family. This wedding feast is going to last seven days. 
to run out of wine, this is, they're going to be the laughing stock of the community. Jesus sees this. His mother says, would you help them? And Jesus does help them. And he helps them. It's, it's like today. It's like you had a big fancy wedding and then, then someone forgot to make the cake or bake a cake. You always have a cake at a wedding, especially if it's a big fancy wedding. It's the same kind of thing. You don't uh, run out of wine in this day. And so Jesus turns the water into wine. You know the story. But he tells them, I want you to notice here, verse 8. I'm getting ahead of the story. He says, draw uh, some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. Now I want you to notice here. He told them, verse 7, fill it up to the brim. Now we could talk right there about full obedience to God. You obey God completely, and there is a blessing. You don't see the full blessings of God because you don't, you don't fulfill all that God is calling you to do. If they had just said, you know what, fill up to the brim, this makes no sense whatsoever. You're asking me to fill these things. It's going to take a lot of work to fill these up to the brim all the way to the top. Got to go get the water. I can't just turn on the spigot. They didn't have spigots back then, all right? Uh, so I'm not going to do that. I got to go haul the water, fill these things up, and it's a lot sometimes. Sometimes it's a lot that God will ask of you. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about servanthood. It's a lot sometimes to go down to the hospital because some friend is down there hurt because somebody cares. It's a lot to, to, to do the things that God would have us do that you can then be a blessing to others. But you want to see the full blessing of God for your life? Then be obedient. Be obedient all the way to what he's called you to do. So fill it up to the brim. And so they did. T dip some of it out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. Now the master of the feast had tasted, tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servant who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom. He said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. Notice that. It's until now. Now is the... Now is when the good wine comes out. When Jesus is in the party, when Jesus is in your midst, that's where there's joy. Yeah, we look forward to it. And I pray a lot. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I look forward to that time that we see him face to face on that day. What a joyous day that's going to be, really. That's going to be a joyous day. I got a lot of friends already in heaven. I got a lot of friends. A lot of you are going there way before me. And some of you are going to, we're racing there, all right? And I got a lot of friends in heaven, and I'm looking forward to that day to, to not only see Jesus, and I can't wait for that day, but to be reunited with those that I love and those that I care for and those that I miss, a lot of friends I miss. But the thing is this, is that he's with us now. Wherever he is, there's joy in this journey. There's joy. As we're talking about in the beginning of this thing, the joy there is in knowing him, following him, serving him. And here, it, 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 you brought out the best until now. When you realize Jesus is with me, Man, the now is the now. Now is now to have that joyous walk with him. Well, it says, this is the beginning of the signs Jesus did at Canaan of Galilee and the manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After he went down to, to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, his disciples, and, and, uh, and they did not stay there many days. In other words, they were there for a while. We're going to talk about Capernaum. We'll do all that. We'll do everything from flyovers, and we'll do the whole Capernaum thing. I want to kind of back up a little bit. I want to talk about something uh, just because it seems to be an issue within the Christian church that we like to fight over. And we like to fight over those. I just, you know, I like a good fight. So let's, uh, let's talk about these things. Let's talk about can Christians drink wine. Can you drink a beer? Can you? Let's talk, can you really? Let's talk about those things. Let's talk about wine, all those things. It's funny to watch Christians because these are the kind of issues is that we love to fight over. It's one that is very, I mean, polarizes people very quickly. And you have this whole two extremes on this thing. You have the one extreme that's very narrow and, and very much judgmental. And man, you know, I'm sinning because of you, because of this. And the very judgmental, and there's one side that says that nobody should be doing anything uh, of the sorts. And that's one side of the issue. The other side of the issue is all the way, hey, party hardy, doesn't matter. I don't care what the Bible says, I'm drinking and let's go party tonight. We're going to go clubbing tonight. No, you shouldn't. And shame on you if you do. And don't say you're a Bible-believing Christian because you're not, if that's what you're doing. And both extremes, let me say this to you, both of those extremes, one that says, very legalistic says, says that nobody is to be doing anything except what I tell you. I got the rules. Here it is. To the, to the other extreme, it says, let's just do whatever. Doesn't matter. I'm going to heaven anyways. Doesn't matter. Both of those is a, is a, major, is a major problem to Christianity. You know what I'm saying? 
It's a major problem in Christianity because you got people that you got people that will will look down on you and you know. So I got I got a neighbor that I love because some meaning Christian got in this person's face and told him you're going to hell and and got in her face. She didn't need to hear that. She needed to know about the love of Christ and that God will forgive her and heal her and set her free from the addiction and the sin that she's in. You got some well-meaning Christian that's a jerk that's in her face telling her, you need to do this and you need to do that. How far did that draw her towards Christ? It did exactly the opposite. It drew her away from God. And now we're doing damage control in some of those things. Saying, no, that's not who Christ is. That is not what Christ is about. So when we talk about issues such as this, and, then, and, and I don't, I'm not afraid to bring out these issues. Kind of like the spanking issue that we had in the church. You know, it was in the, in the text. It was talking about uh, disciplining your children. I did, a, I did the topic of the message, spank or not to spank, if that is the question. And man, we had church fights over that. It was fun. You know, it was fun. You know, beat those children right in front of each other. <laughs> Stop beating that kid. Well, this is one of those same kind of things. The Bible speaks a lot about wine. 200, over 250 times the Bible speaks about, about wine. Now, when I, before I talk about this too, and I want to talk about uh, the positives and the negatives, talk about this whole thing in a biblical perspective, I want you to understand this. I fully understand the damage and the harm that alcoholism does to families, that do, it destroys lives. I fully understand. I didn't know this. I didn't understand this until I started doing this study, is that the number one killer of our youth today is alcohol. I didn't know that. That comes from the Bureau of Statistics. The number one killer of our youth is, alco is alcohol-related incidences. It's the number one problem with the kids. It's, so I understand the issue with alcohol. I understand that there is, there is um, those that abuse it. I understand there's those in the church who absolutely... You, you, do not come to me and say this. Say, well, the pastor says I can drink wine. I'm telling you, you can't. All right, how's that? You like me now? We're not done yet. All right. And so there's those that will, will use moments like this and say, well, I have an excuse to go out and sin. No, you don't have an excuse to go out and do anything, all right? So I understand the, the difficulties, all right? Let me turn this over now, look at the other side of it. The other side is this. Historically within the church, alcohol has never been a problem. It's been a problem for those drunk, but, they, but that was not the issue of those. In fact, many times, if you look at church history, many times the pastors were also the ones that were doing, were, were the, brew, the brewers, all right? You see this. You see people like John Calvin. We don't necessarily like his doctrine, but we like his pay scale because he got paid. I don't know if this is true or not, whether we like it or not. Depends on how you feel about this. Is that he got feel, what are we talking about? He got, he got paid a salary and 250 gallons of wine a year. That was his salary. Not that I'm asking for that. Not that I'm kind of paying for that, all right? That's not the deal. You look at people like Martin Luther. His wife was one that made beer. In fact, I, on, the, on the internet, I posted some of the letters and one of his sermons about alcohol, which is very interesting, as he's talking about how he's in an area uh, that the beer was terrible. And he said, honey, he said, he's telling his wife, Kath, uh, Kathleen, you need to send me some of your beer because the beer here is terrible, you know? Well, how can that be a man of God? That's definitely going to be a, a, a problem at all. No, it really was not a problem with Martin Luther, with these individuals, because at, one of the ones that did his eulogy, Martin Luther's death, said this, every one of us has seen him drink. Not one of us has ever seen him drunk. You know, there's the perspective right there. Never seen him drunk. Now, here's the issue, is this whole thing within the church, we love to fight over these issues. We love to pick fights over these issues. But now let's go, what does the Bible say concerning this? And it's always interesting as you see people going at the Bible with the preconceived ideas that I'm going to find this in it, and yet going into it and saying, what does the Bible really say about this? You'll have some that say, well, uh, in Bible times, in Bible times, they used to cut their wine uh, with water. And so the alcohol today and, and the wine today and the wine in Bible times was completely different. It, it was non-alcoholic. Uh, that is not true. That is not true at all. In fact, you can see that consistently throughout the Bible. It is an alcoholic uh, wine that's made. When God wants to define that it's grape juice, which he does in some passages, he uses a specific word for grape juice. But when he talks about wine, he's talking about wine. The only time is only one time in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah, does it say that, that, that the wine was cut with water. 
And that was, a, that was an indictment to the merchants that were ripping off those that were buying the wine. And God was coming against them saying, look, you're cutting the wine with water. Okay, so you have these that say, well, it's not the same. Well, I would beg to differ on that when you're looking at Bible times, when you're looking at this time, that we're looking at through the word of God, what is it saying concerning this? Because wine in the Bible, wine in the Bible is a blessing from God. Right? You think about Melchizedek, going all the way back in Genesis. Melchizedek, when he came, is a type of Christ. Melchizedek, when he encountered Abraham, what did he give Abraham? He gave him bread and what? And wine. Right? He said, well, that was grape juice. No, it doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't work within that word. It doesn't work. There's three words in the Old Testament for wine. There's two in the New Testament. One of those, new, one of those words is only used one time in the book of Acts. And so the specific wording is important to what's going on. But I want you to listen to this. Just listen to the context of this. Deuteronomy 14. It says, use the silver. This is the dietary law for, the, for God's people. It says, use the silver to buy whatever you like, to, to buy cattle or sheep or wine or other fermented drinks or anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. Deuteronomy 14. Ecclesiastes 9 says, says, go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart for God has already accepted your works. Psalms 104. He says, he, speaking of God, causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the, for the service of man he has, he has uh, brought forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man. Who does that? Who brings forth wine that, brings, that, that makes the heart glad? God brings that forth. Amos, Amos 9, a blessing is they're coming back in the land from their captivity. It says, I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. And you can go on and on and on as the scripture is clear that wine was always a blessing. It was a blessing that God had given. In fact, if you look at Isaiah 24 and you look at the, the time that we're going to be standing in his presence on that day, one of the menu items Matthew, or, or in, in Isaiah 25, one of the menu items is wine. So be careful before you say, you know, wine is something that we absolutely uh, need to stay away from. I'm going to say this to you. If you have a problem with it, any of those issues, you absolutely need to stay away from it. But let me give you some, some rules of engagement here. What does the Bible say concerning this? Because I'm going to tell you right up front, the wine was a blessing given from God, right? My, your pastor is not telling you you can drink at all, right? So with that on the table now, all right, so I'm a Christian. I'm looking at this. What does the Bible say concerning Christians drinking wine or drinking these things? Three things. Number one is this. God has commanded Christians not to get drunk, period. This is not negotiable at all. All right. The Bible is crystal clear. Wine is not the problem. What you do with it is a problem. You take this, this something that God has given to be a blessing and now you have perverted this thing. Uh, uh, Ephesians 5, it says, do, do not get drunk with wine in which is dispensation or, you know, causes riots, but be filled with the Spirit. It says, do not get drunk. Do not get drunk because that's a counterfeit. No, you don't need to be drunk. You need the filling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is the real thing. Getting drunk is the counterfeit. So no, you, sh you are not to be getting drunk. In fact, the Bible mocks this. In Proverbs 23, Proverbs 23, I want you to listen to this. I like reading it out of the New Living. Uh, listen to what it says. It says, who has anguish? Who has sorrow? Who is also fighting? Who is always complaining? Who has unnecessary bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? It is the one who spends long hours at the tavern trying out new drinks. <laughs> Don't gaze at the wine seeing how red it is, how it sparkles in the cup, how smooth it goes down. This is Proverbs 23. He is swirling the wine. Oh, how does it smell? Oh, it goes down so well. For in the end, it bites like a poisonous snake. It stings like a viper. You shall see hallucinations and you will say crazy things. Hello. <laughs> you will stagger like a sailor tossed by the sea, clinging to the swaying mast. You will say, they hit me and I did not feel it. I, I didn't even know it when they beat me up. When will I wake up so I can, I can, I can look for another drink? 
Proverbs 23. I mean, it's really just a mocking of those that would get drunk, those that would drink, those to drink and, and, and get drunk. Now, here's the thing. Technically, the priests, Leviticus 10, uh, Ezekiel 44, the priests were to drink no alcohol while performing duty. All right? So while, while, the, while the, the priest was there, he was to drink absolutely no alcohol whatsoever. And yet, while not working Numbers 18, it was even a part of his pay was, was wine. So after work, he could, but, but not, again, moving the, the drunk thing. No, you can't get drunk. That's, no. The Bible's very clear. You're a child of God now. These, this is what the Word of God says, right? And so those that are in the priesthood were, were not to drink, but after, even part of their pay was in wine. No king was to drink while judging the law, Proverbs 31. An elder or a pastor was not to be a drunkard, not given to wine, not someone that's a, that's a, that's a drunk, First Timothy 3, Titus 1, 7. Now listen to this. Here's a deal killer for you. There is no drunkard will inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5. No drunkard will inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot make an excuse, say, well, I can get drunk. No, you can't. You're a child of God now. That's who you used to be. That's who you was. And so do, do we get to, I got to make sure we're clear on this. This is one of those things that I'm not going to just throw it out there and have someone say, well, pastor said I can drink. You know, I'll drink to that. You know, no, no way. No way. You get drunk, you're in sin, and you're going straight to hell. How's that? Amen. Okay, amen. Preach it, Pastor. All right. <laughs> Second point, all right, on this. Christians are commanded not to allow their bodies be, to be mastered by anything. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 6. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. All things are lawful. But no, not everything is helpful. All things are lawful, but I will not be under bondage of anything, as the Bible says. Also, 2 Peter 2 says the same thing. I will not be under the bondage of anything. Listen, if you're struggling with this, that's what Thursday nights are all about. Freedom from addiction. Get set free from that. If you have any kind of this, any kind of alcoholism or any kind of that, that, that abusive behavior, uh, addictive behavior in your past, you need to stay completely away from this. This is not something to be playing with, playing with fire. You don't go there. So you'll never be brought under the bondage of anything, the Bible says. So you're not to get drunk. That's a given. You're not to, you're, you're, you're commanded not to allow anything to master your physical body. Third thing is this, scripture forbids a Christian from doing anything causing others to stumble. 1 Corinthians 8, but food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worst. Now the problem with this is, not the problem with this, but the issue he's dealing with is that he's dealing not, ex, not actually with wine here, he's, he's dealing with meat sacrificed to idols. If you're familiar with this, um, there was the, you'd bring your meat, you'd have an idol, you'd take, their, take it to the butcher, the butcher would, would take your meat and he'd sacrifice it to idols. They still do simi similar things today. And you go to Hawaii and you see on the graves, you ever see this on the graves? They have the little, the little uh, food and sometimes you'll see beer there and they're on, they're on the graves. Same kind of thing, offering these, this food, you'll see sometimes you'll eat maybe in, a, in a, uh, a restaurant where they have a little Buddha up there in the corner. You'll see little food items up there. It's the same thing. So they still do this today in, in different forms. But the thing is this, is that, that eating meat sacrificed to idols, some would see that and say, look, I'm not eating that meat, you know, because uh, the butcher would take that, sacrifice it to an idol, take it, and then sell the meat. Well, the best meat and the cheapest meat was coming from that place. And so you go over there and buy that. And Paul is saying, look, it doesn't matter. He says, uh, it does not commend us to God for either if you eat, are we the better? Or if we don't eat, where are we the worst? It doesn't matter if you eat, or, uh, eat, this, eat this meat or not. He says, he says, but beware lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. So don't be out there flaunting that because you'll cause somebody who's weak to stumble in these things. Romans 14 says, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one whom Christ died. So we are to walk in love towards one another, not flaunting these things. Not flaunting, well, I have liberty. No, you don't. You don't have liberty to cause people to stumble. You don't have liberty to get out there and just flaunt what you think is your freedom. 
You have liberty in that. Now, again, this is, this is a balancing act here because now you got to flip this on the other side is this is because the, in Christianity, this is part, that, part in churchianity, I should say, that I actually do not like is that it's so easy in churchianity for us to say, I'm sinning, I have issues, and it's your fault, pastor. It's your fault, leader. It's your fault. And you want to blame others for your walk instead of saying, you know what? I got issues and I need to deal with them. It's one thing. My, my responsibility, walk in love. Don't cause anybody to stumble. Res, the, the responsibility of the other person is don't be looking at others, don't look at others, be pointing fingers, say, look, what you're doing is wrong, and I'm going to tell everybody it's wrong. What you're doing is stumbling others, and you need to stop this. Uh, for one thing, that's gossip. For one thing, that's destroying lives when you do that. Do you understand this? This kind of stuff rips through the church constantly. And there will inevitably be somebody who says, now, Pastor Terry was teaching on Sunday that we can all go get drunk. And you never heard anything I said, did you? You didn't hear anything I said. And yet that kind of stuff goes around so quickly. We in the church love to throw rocks at one another. We need to stop those kind of things. And quit blaming others for your lack of integrity or your lack of discipline. Quit blaming others. Own up your own sin. Stop blaming others. Stop playing the blame game. And we do that in the church. We do that. We like to blame others for, I got a problem, and it's your fault that I'm this way. No, you're that way because you need to buy a mirror. That's why you're like that, all right? And look at yourself in the mirror. Okay, that's what I mean, not because you need makeup, all right? <laughs> we all got to look at this. So again, our responsibility, your personal responsibility is this. You're going to walk in love. Ask yourself this. In fact, I'm, I'm a couple of verses here, but ask yourself this before you do anything. Before you do anything, whether you have liberty or not liberty, ask yourself this, is this walking in love? Is this walking in love? The way I'm responding to this, the way, the way that, the way that I'm, I'm presenting myself, the things that I'm doing, is this walking in love? I tell you what, it'll change some of our lives. If you're going to say, is this truly love? Is this truly love? But there will always be those that will, the, in fact, the end times uh, says this in 1 Timothy 4, it says, the spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Teaching, such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose conscience have been seared with a hot iron. Now here's what they're doing. It says, this is the end times. This is those that are hypocritical. They're lying. This is what they're saying. They're forbidding people to marry and ordering them to abstain from certain foods, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and, and who know the truth. For everything God has created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. So can a Christian drink? I'm not going to answer that for you. I'm going to say this. No, you can't get drunk. No, you better be walking in love. Don't let your liberty cause a stumbling block for those around you. And no, you cannot be uh, mastered by anything. You know, I can't get home. You know, I can't, I can't hardly deal with it until I have my beer. You know, well, then maybe you ought to do that. Cigarettes are the same. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things like that. Overeating, hello. We're the Bubba generation. You know, I had somebody, um, <laughs> had a pastor that was on our television program, and he's a good friend, and I knew I could do this, and he was waxing eloquently about something, you know, about this sin that he was really against, and I knew that he smoked cigars. And so, um, so he went off eloquently about all these things that he, that he was against, you know, drinking wine and those that, those that were into gluttony and all this stuff that he was against. And he just was going on and on and on about this. And he said there, and it was, if you get this on the, um, the, the radio, the television program we were doing, and he goes on and on about this. And it wasn't, it, it, was, it was a local pastor, but not Pastor John. All right, so just so you know, <laughs> Pastor John smokes cigars? Yeah, but don't tell anybody, all right? <laughs> he doesn't. Okay, so I knew this guy smoked cigars. And so after he got all done with this, I said to him, okay, so how does that fit in? What about smoking cigars? And he turned all red. He said, you're a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Thank you very much. Because you know what? Here, here's what we do. Instead of looking at the speck, actually the log in our own eye, 
We want to pick specks in other people's eyes. Now, I'm not saying that we should not walk together in love. We need to. This is family. What we say often, we're doing life together. We're kind of just going through life together. We're having kids. We're seeing kids raise up. We're having grandkids. We're seeing people die. We're seeing divorces. We're seeing things happen. We're just a bunch of people doing life together. And so on these issues, if you have somebody that's an alcoholic struggling in this area, yes, we need to be working together and trying to help one another, but not throwing rocks at one another. Not be pointing fingers. Because that's the very thing that draws people. It's like my neighbor. It's the very thing that drew, draws her away from Christ. When we start getting so narrow and pointing fingers at one another. Lord help us. That didn't bring me to Christ. What brought me to Christ was his love and compassion. And then when I came to Christ, then he started doing the work from the inside out. And started working all this stuff out of my life. I'm not talking about anything I haven't, I, I haven't walked. Right? So this whole issue of alcohol. I hope it's clear that um, you go down this road, you better walk it in integrity. You better walk it. You better understand what the Word of God says. And for the vast majority, you just need to stay away from it. All right? How's that? Amen. There you go. All right. We'll pick it up next time. We'll be talking about um, <laughs> something else. It's, it's fun. Going through the life of Christ is fun because we're going to hit so many different topics. And some topics, I got to tell you, I have not been as nervous about a topic in, in a couple years than this topic. Because I know, because the spanking thing was cool, because I knew, I, knew, I knew what I was getting into. This one, I know they can be taken wrong so easily. And I'll make sure that people understand where the stance is from a biblical perspective.